How you guys doing? Hello, President Castro. Welcome. Hi, Dr. Castro. Hi there. Nice to see you all. Same here. Very good day. And we'll wait about one or two more minutes and start with the program. Okay. Thank you, everyone. But do you have enough turkey? Plenty, plenty, plenty left over in the fridge. <laughs> I've got, got lunch and dinner for the rest of the week. <laughs> Sounds good. Someone is asking, is there ever enough turkey? <laughs> yeah, my leftovers didn't make it through the weekend. <laughs> My son's a really good cook, so he uh, he took charge, which is great. The older one. David, you can go ahead and start. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. How you guys doing today? Uh, my name is Davion Baker, gender pronouns, he, him, they, and them. Uh, I wanna be the first to welcome you to our uh, amazing event that we have, our Men, Masculinity, and Leadership Zoom panel discussion. Uh, we have some dope panelists uh, that we have today. But before we get into that, we gotta go over some housekeeping. Uh, we're gonna start with some land acknowledgements. Um, the Fresno State Campus sits in the midst of the San Joaquin Valley, a valley rich of the tradition and representation of Native American people and cultures. We are grateful to be in the traditional homeland of the Yukats and the Mano people who diverse tribal communities share stewardship over this land. So we definitely want to acknowledge those amazing people and those tribal people. Uh, some other housekeeping rules uh, or housekeeping uh, updates that we wanted to go over today, that today's program is brought to you by and hosted by the man success initiative and some of the things that the man uh, man success initiative have been doing throughout this academic year throughout 2020 number one um, we've created a podcast an amazing podcast that is led on by our brother jerry gomez who's already dropped three episodes and has got over 400 downloads and if you're looking for an amazing podcast to listen to that's one of the chosen few. So you wanna be sure to check that out. Um, we also have a Man Success Initiative mentorship program uh, where we're serving our men of color here at Fresno State. Uh, we have an MSI or a Man Success Initiative website. And we're currently planning for our 2020 academic year, our spring year for events and programs such as like the one we're doing today. Uh, and if you didn't know, uh, the Man Success Initiative is is made up of administrative staff, faculty, uh, and students, and most importantly, Fresno State alum. And our job is to continue to support our men of color here at Fresno State. Um, so before we introduce our panelists, or we have our panelists introduce ourselves, I just wanted to give you another tidbit that we will be having Q&A uh, in the last 10 minutes. So if you have um, some amazing questions for our panelists, be sure to either write those down or put them in the chat. Uh, and then when we get to our Q&A, we'll be sure to ask as many questions as we can. We know we only have about an hour or so. Um, and so we wanna be mindful of the time. Um, but without further ado, it's time to get to the nitty gritty of what you guys are here for and what you guys signed up for. Uh, we have some amazing panelists, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, tell them, uh, tell them a little bit about themselves. Um, maybe a, uh, a small interesting fact, their role here at Fresno State, and we're going to start with the very own, our president, soon to be, CSU Chancellor-elect, President Joseph Castro. Thank you, Devon. It's good to join all of you today. I'm gonna have to brag to my daughter that you said I'm a dope panelist. She'll like that. <laughs> I am, uh, as Devon said, Joe Castro, uh, president of Fresno State for one more month and uh, chancellor select of the CSU. I've been looking forward to this conversation and uh, you guys decided to have an old man join. 
the panel here. Um, I'm happy to do it. I, I come at it from as a, a son of a single mama and, uh, you know, a, a father as well and husband. And uh, I, I have the great gift of uh, being able to kind of get a bonus child here. I, I raised two adult children with Mary and now we get this other guy. He's a special, special guy almost 10 years old. So I'm having a chance to be a father in all these different decades and I'm enjoying that. So I look forward to this conversation with all of you. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Um, let's start with Fon Yang. My brother Fon Yang is in the building. All right, thank you. Thank you and um, a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, again, my name is Fong Yang. I'm the Director of Admissions and Recruitment here at Fresno State. Uh, I've been at Fresno State since I was a student, so I've never left. When I say Fresno State gave me everything, Fresno State did give me everything I have. <laughs> so to myself, my family, and my, my wife, we both came here. So we're both proud Fresno State Bulldogs. My two oldest kids are here now. So one is about to graduate next May and one is in her third year. So we're really proud to be uh, here. I, uh, I am a uh, first generation student who graduated from college, uh, first in my family along with, and then, and I grew up in three continents. So I, I was a refugee. My parents were refugees of the uh, Vietnam War. And uh, we, I was born in Laos. Uh, I grew up in France where I finished, I mean, I've completed eighth grade there and I came over here and I started ninth grade. So I didn't, half of my education in France and half of my education here in the United States. So I have a different perspective from three different continents, but um, pleasure to be here and pleasure to be part of the panel. Awesome, we, we are, are excited to have you a part of our family, Fon. Thank you for all the amazing work that you do. Uh, we got another bright young man in the building, uh, my brother TJ Taylor. Why don't you introduce yourself to the people? Yes, sir. Good day, everyone. My name is uh, TJ Taylor. I am the student coordinator for African American programs and services and leadership development programs and services at the Cross Cultural and Gender Center. I'm um, finishing up my uh, last semester in undergrad. That's a blessing. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just an honor. It's a pleasure to be on the same panel as uh, Dr. Dr. Castro and um, um, CSU Chancellor-elect uh, Castro and be here with Fong Yang as well as my um, peer, um, 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 Estevan as well. So it's just a pleasure to be here and um, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Brother Taylor. And last but not least, this is the man with multiple titles. He does so much here on this campus. I'm telling you, they're going to be hearing about this man from years to come. Our brother Estevan Prada, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Esteban Parra Guerrero, pronouns he, him, his, and I am the coordinator of Gender Programs and Services and LGBTQ plus programs and services, and I also serve as part of the Men's Success Initiative. Like Fong Yang mentioned, I did my undergrad, uh, grad studies, gra I was a graduate student, and now I'm here with the Cross Culture and Gender Center. So I've been on campus since 2008. I earned my undergraduate under President Custer's leadership, a master's program, and I started my first higher education job under President Castro's leadership. We're gonna miss you dearly, President Castro. Thank you, everyone. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I almost forgot, we will be doing an assessment, so be sure to be on the lookout for that as we get close to the end of our discussion. And also make sure you got your questions ready because we would love to have uh, ask this panelist uh, some amazing questions. But without further ado, we're going to get into what you came here for, starting with our question number one that is directed to our President Castro. Um, why is it important to see men of color in leadership roles? Thank you, Devon. I think it's critically important because um, we want to make sure that um, all men of color, uh, and especially our youngest ones, uh, understand that, that they can achieve at the highest levels. And you know, I remember as a kid growing up in Hanford, just south of here, uh, there was there was one one Latinx man in in Hanford who had gone to Stanford and was an attorney, and. I was just so impressed with him and had a chance to meet him. And, and he was somebody that um, 
for me, uh, just inspired me to try to, to do better. Um, I, I was also supported by my grandfather who didn't go to college, but was so wise. And he definitely was uh, probably the most influential role model in my life. And so as I think about it today, um, the responsibility that I have as your president uh, is I've tried to be a role model for students through my own uh, words and most importantly through my actions. And um, I don't know if many people know this about Fresno State, but today on the Fresno State President's Cabinet, every male on the cabinet is a male of color. I'm not sure that's ever happened in our 109 plus year history, but I wanted to say that out loud because sometimes when I get into conversations with this group, I think, wow, it's, it's incredible that we have these extraordinarily talented folks uh, on the cabinet. And it's just coincidentally <laughs> that they're all uh, men of color along with extraordinarily talented women who serve on the cabinet. And, and that's important because they understand through their own lived experiences, like I do, that um, you know, we have a chance to make a difference from a policy standpoint, financial standpoint, but again, most importantly, through our words and our actions. And then finally, I'll mention just a, a brief story with my young son, who's gonna be 10 years old. Um, he's had a number of teachers throughout his young life but I've never seen him do as well as I have this year. And I do think that it's because he has a, a male of color, a Latinx teacher, the only one in his whole school. The only male in his whole school happens to be a male of color. And I see how much better academically he's doing than ever before. And, you know, I didn't have the opportunity to have that many men of color in my own collegiate career and I still was able to succeed. But I just think about how fortunate he is to have that and how um, important it is for us to, to have role models uh, who are men of color in universities and throughout society as leaders because in the end that's going to inspire more men of color to achieve their, their goals and fulfill their dreams. Thank you, Dr. Castro, for that amazing answer. I love how he talked about having role models and having representation in people that look like you who are men of color. So I definitely appreciate that um, comment. Uh, moving on to our next question. This is directed to Fong Yang. Were there challenges slash obstacles you encountered related to your race or relevant identity? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, uh, and I think we're here to learn from one another. And, and I think so. I'm going to share my perspective as I um, grew up into my professional career, and I think uh, also my observation uh, coming from a uh, Southeast Asian community. Uh, and if you were to ask my kids, who are college kids, and I also have a ten-year-old like Dr. Castro, if you ask my college kids, they will give you a different uh, opinion about leadership. Uh, and if you ask my 10 year old, he would be even more, I want to say drastic in his, uh, in his, his answer about leadership. So I grew up in my community as, um, uh, as where leadership is something that it's, it's almost opposite of what the Western culture is, is that as a leader, you're supposed to listen more and you're supposed to think more and you must say way less. And so as, as I grew up, and I went through college and even the classrooms. Those are things that were ingrained in me uh, as part of my DNA, where you have to stay quiet. You have to do what you're told. You know, if you are, if you have a boss, uh, you uh, always make your boss look good and you always do what your boss say. You, you don't, you don't, you don't make, you make sure the spotlight is never on you as an individual. So try to, Keep away the attention from yourself, and and it, it shapes you as 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 a different type of leader. Not not in a bad way. I think that, that for me, it shaped me in the leader that I am today because of those uh, those things that were taught to me by my parents, my grandparents, and and uh, 
you know, what I was told, uh, talked, uh, taught, taught in, you know, as, as a uh, individual was that, you know, you, you can think about things, you know, and, but you don't have to voice yourself. And uh, if you are going to voice yourself, you have to have thought it through so carefully and seen it from all the different angles. So it's really rare for an individual uh, from, from my community, for example, uh, around individuals around my age or older to be in a meeting and start a conversation and say, hey, let's do this and that, uh, because it's not something that cult that's culturally done. Uh, you, I was also raised, you know, as you, sh you should always have a solution before you speak up, for example. So if you didn't have a solution, it's probably, you, you don't speak up. And when you, when you need something, uh, technically, then typically you don't ask for it uh, because if you, if, you, if you need something and you ask for it, it kind of shows that maybe you're not equipped to do your work uh, or you're not equipped to be in the position you're in. So you kind of have to figure things on your own and you should go beyond, always go beyond what's, what's expected of you. Uh, and you, your hope is that by doing all of these is that someone eventually recognize you. And so, so it's always, almost like you put yourself out there, but without really putting yourself out there. <laughs> and I know it's hard to explain, but in, in my culture and, and, and from coming from the Hmong community, that's how I was uh, brought up. And those are the, the uh, leadership qualities I've brought, you know, along with me. In, in, and, and there's no, it's, it's, those are great qualities. And like I was saying, saying earlier, when you talk to my kids nowadays, you wouldn't know that they came from the same community that I came in because they are, they are voicing themselves clearly. <laughs> and that's a great thing. Uh, but again, it were two different generations and just one generation apart uh, 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 sets us apart from one another. Thank you. Thank you, Yang, for that amazing answer. I appreciate that. Um, I know we asked uh, President Castro this question, but I wanted to come back to TJ and ask him a similar question. Why do you think that it is important to see men of color in leadership roles? That's a great question because I think ultimately um, representation matters. Um, often we can underestimate our ability to inspire people. Uh, seeing people who look like me in power is a visual that sparks like my ambition and challenges my conscience to like want more for myself. and. Um, uh seeing people of color and power kind of shows me that like um this myth of gatekeeping is not necessarily real and that there's there's enough like significance and, and there, there's enough there's enough success for everybody to share and it's like um academic success is not a trait exclusive to one demographic or what have you or any success in particular it's not exclusive to anyone so you just seeing those examples are very uh, pivotal and influential in my life. Uh, so, yeah, that's a that's why I think uh, um, people in color and leadership is very important at representation. <clears throat> I love how you said that the representation matters, and, and if you see it, then you can believe it. Uh, appreciate that response and coming and coming back with uh the question that Fong answered uh how do you feel as far as like discuss any challenges or obstacles you encountered related to your race or relevant identities Estevan thank you Davian for that question um so you know I, I come from a very traditional Mexican family I have 10 siblings and I identify as Mexican American Latino and as part of the LGBTQ plus community. So I, I would like to focus today on my LGBTQ plus identity. For many re reasons, I was afraid to come out to my family, which is the reason why it took me over 10 years to do so. From a professional standpoint, I always felt like I had to work twice as hard uh, to earn that promotion, to earn that one position that I applied for. Prior to Fresno State, I worked for a Fortune 500 company. And I will never forget when the Orlando uh, nightclub shooting took place, Pulse nightclub, where over, sorry, where 49 LGBTQ plus people were killed. I promise you all, I went to work the next day to work my 10 hour shift. 
and not even management, not even my coworkers, my staff, customers or contractors took a second of their day to acknowledge that incident. So for me, working in that particular company, I, had, I felt like I had to hide my identity of being a gay man because I was, again, afraid of not earning that promotion and or a well-deserved bonus, right? So I now work at Fresno State where we have a campus president who attends some of our LGBTQ plus events. I now work at the Fresno State Cross Culture and Gender Center where, where I have amazing leaders like Dr. Francino Puta and Dr. Vicky Taylor who remind me that tears are welcome, who remind me that I could be whoever I want to be at the Cross Culture and Gender Center. So that for me was very challenging at the very beginning because I was so used to hearing otherwise. That was really challenging, you know, coming to Fresno State, coming to the CCGC and having these amazing leaders telling me that tears are welcome. It was tough because again, I have heard otherwise, right? That men don't cry and you're supposed to hold it in and suck it up and move forward with life. So, you know, I recently saw these, uh, this TED, TED Talk video um, where women, it was a conversation between four women and four men. And one of the reasons, right, according to research, according to these women, uh, women tend, one of the reasons why they live longer than men is because they're not afraid to show their emotions. So I would like to remind everyone that my experience is completely different than a transgender student, faculty, and staff. My experience might be completely different than a person who identifies as male and African-American, Black, and so on. And that's why it's, it is important to continue learning, right? So I welcome you all to continue learning. I welcome you all to reach out to us and let's learn together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Savan, for those powerful words. Uh, we're happy to have you a part of Fresno State, and I'm, I'm happy you found a community where you can voice how you feel and you, you don't have to keep it within. Um, I'm sorry you have to go through that, but sometimes we got to go through some things to get to where we want to be. So I definitely want to applaud you on that. Um, this next question is for President Castro. Um, as the newly CSU Chancellor-elect, what does the future of CSU look like in five to 10 years for students, staff, faculty, or who identify as men of color? Thank you, Devon. I'm, I'm gonna answer that in a moment, Devon, but I, I just wanna say um, to Estevan, thank you for uh, choosing to be at Fresno State and thank you for uh, helping to uh, educate uh, you know, people like me who um, who've, who've learned from you and um, can make better judgments, decisions on campus about policies and programs because you've you've taken the time and you've had the patience to to do that and and you've done that with our leadership team here on campus and I just want to thank you for for being a leader in that way. You've really helped uh, helped me and helped so many other leaders on the campus. So. Just want to express my appreciation to you for that, and uh, and and Devion, I I'm really optimistic about the future. Um, some people think overly optimistic, but I I know this pandemic has been so difficult in so many ways for uh, many of us, and I do believe we have some choppy waters here in the next uh, several months. But but after that, I, I actually see um, a lot of reason to be hopeful uh, because we've we've gone through this tough time. We've learned a lot, and um, I know that for me as the new chancellor, um, I'm going to dedicate my whole uh, tenure to removing barriers for our talented students and especially those who are underrepresented and uh, and and men of color included to make sure that. Um, you all have the support you need at each of the 23 campuses to uh, to be successful, and I'm I'm really focused on um, on that Pell gap that exists all across the system because so many men of color, are, you know, make up uh, the Pell students. I was a Pell student, and and I know it took me a little bit of time to 
to adjust to being a first generation of college student. And then once I got my footing at Berkeley, I, I was able to take off and, and graduate and do well. But at the beginning, it was pretty scary. I had no idea really what a university was all about. So I try to carry that perspective with me as president now and as chancellor that I, I wanna do everything I can to provide the support so that all of our talented students, including our men of color, succeed. And I'd like to see more men of color as faculty members throughout the CSU, as uh, staff members, as administrators and leaders, including uh, campus presidents. And, uh, and I think it'll be very important in the coming years for us to figure out some new strategies to do that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of tired of strategies that take 10 years and 20 years and all that. I, I'm going to be looking for strategies to try to do things much faster. And um, we've made a lot of progress here, but there's so much more left to do. And uh, in the end, it's going to take all of us working together as one team. And, you know, I think about the CSU system as 500 extraordinarily 500,000 extraordinarily talented students, 50,000 faculty and staff, 3.8 million alumni, and all of California and the country supporting uh, what I think is the most important and consequential public university system in the country. We need the CSU to succeed and uh, we need our men of color to succeed. So. I'm going to do everything I can with all of you to to see that happen in the next five to ten years and and uh, and beyond for decades ahead. Thank you, President Castro, for that. I truly feel like we're in good hands. I don't know about y'all, but I I truly feel like we're in good hands moving forward. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for those kind yeah. words, brother. Um, this next question is for my brother T.J. Taylor. How can Fresno State create a sense of belonging? for students who are men? And then the second part of that is, what can we as a campus do to create a culture that promised the power of male sensitivity and, the reje and to reject tendencies like toxic male masculinity? I think, um, I think about like one of the most prominent role models in American history, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, when I watch like documentaries on him, um, what I learned is that like the way he spoke on the podium is the same way that he spoke like off the camera. And I feel like that's a very admirable trait because uh, I think um, creating this sense of belonging and respect is it, something that we're all a part of. It's something that we all have an individual task to do. Um, it's like a, we are the energy that we keep and it's like a, we have to continue to be kind to each other and embody positive characteristics like um, empathy and compassion um, and have a philosophy that like includes respecting all people. Um, uh, and in order to do this, like I said, we are the energy that we keep. We must um, keep, continue to hold our peers accountable. Like when they say something distasteful, it's okay to say, okay, that's not okay. Um, you have to be the solution to the pollution um, and continue to make the environment better just for yourself around you as well as the workplace or wherever you're at. So, yeah. I love that. Solution to the pollution, right? Mm -hmm. Gotta have that positive mindset and, and hold your brothers in, in, accountable and your sisters accountable. So, I appreciate those words, definitely. Thank you, thank you for those comments, brother. Um, this next question for our brother Fong Yang. Who helped you throughout your educational and career journey? How can your experience help us to recreate, recreate those opportunities you've had that contributed to your success in leadership? Thank you. It's a great question. So I'm going to share a little bit about myself on this question because I think I think uh, we I don't know we we remember most by storytelling. So I'm going to do a little, do a little storytelling here. Uh, first of all, I, I I have four individuals to thank for uh, to put me through you know college 
and then getting me where I'm at today. You know, the first two people that uh, that were my inspiration and my first teachers were my parents, as as many of, of us. Uh, they they were farmers. Uh, they they were refugees. They came to the U.S. in their 40s. Uh, they didn't know English, so they had to farm. They came to Fresno just for farming, and and all all the kids who came with them including myself, we had to work the land, you know, in, throughout high school. Uh, and I, I remember not ever being able to play sports in high school, which I, you know, I really love playing soccer, <laughs> coming from France, of course. And, and uh, I couldn't play soccer because every day after school, I had to walk to the farm. And our farm was on Toll House, uh, you know, right by Clovis, Clovis High School. And my, my mom uh, shared with me one day, you know, she showed me her hands and she's, you know, she, my mom never wore uh, uh uh, nail polish on her hands because she was farming and she showed me her hand all calloused and she said, she had, said, said these, these are the uh, hands of a working person and I want you to go to school and I want you to work with the pen so that your hands don't look like mine. And so I remember those words till this day. That's what really motivates me to, to go through school and to do the things that I do. And I want to push that to the next generations of, of students out there as well. Uh, so my parents, and then you know the third person uh, that really inspired me almost uh, indirectly was was my counselor, my high school counselor. Uh, I still remember his name, Mr. Newton. He was my high school counselor at Clovis High School. In my senior year, he just said, "Fong, I think you should go to college. You you got the grades to go to college." And I didn't even know about Fresno State at that time. He just said, "You should go to Fresno State." So I said, "Okay, is that a college?" He says, "Yeah, it's a university." So he he did all the paperwork, sent me, to, and and that's how I ended up at, at Fresno State. And then of, and, and then my my um, but my biggest motivator in, in, in is is uh, by far my wife, who I spent you know uh, majority of my my life with, the the biggest part of my life with, and she's also in in a leadership position. Uh, with Fresno Unified, and we always brainstorm about leadership. And we always brainstorm about, you know, what's, how will we react to certain situations and so forth. So the biggest learnings, I think, take place between myself and, and, and my, my wife. And uh, how, so we have a lot of discussions, and how do we recreate, uh, you know, uh, those, those experiences for people? I, I think that it's really important for us to, uh, being there from for one another, uh, there, you know, there, there sh we shouldn't be afraid to share uh, with others our, our experience, especially people who haven't been where we have been before. Uh, we we do that well in, in certain areas as human beings. Like we re we like to refer people to great great restaurants, watching good movies, and visiting you know great places that we've been to. But what about leadership? And what about being a good human uh, overall? What about sharing with others how to become a better leader? Uh, we, we have to be able to see beyond what they are now and, and instead seeing what they will be and take that time to speak to them. You know, uh, sometime, uh, sometimes like, like my counselor uh, back in high school, you, you may have to push them a little hard even because they don't know what's good for them yet. So it's, you know, you have to push them, like go to Fresno State. I didn't know what, I didn't even know Fresno State. Just go there, it's gonna be good for you. And sure enough, it was good for me. So sometimes we have to take that initiative when we recognize that that person can be what they can be, we have to also push them as well. So maybe that's one way we can also recreate those environments for them. Ooh, that brother was dropping some gems. I don't know about y'all. But he was dropping some gems right there. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me is when he talked about his mom and, and the hand analogy to, to go to education or you won't. My father said the exact somewhat similar thing to me in the car. And, I, and that res resonated with me so much. I was like, wow, that is crazy. Because my dad told me the same thing in the car when he was working. The first thing he said, do you want hands like these? And then it talked about the importance of going to school. So definitely for those gems, man. Thank you so much, Fawn, for that. I appreciate you, man. I definitely do. Um, whoa, we got some amazing panelists, man. We we got some amazing panelists. I don't know about y'all, but we got some amazing panelists. But let's keep it going because of the time frame. Um, this question is for Estevan. Considering the low retention rates of men of color slash men in higher education, what do you believe should be the best approach to close the retention and the graduation gap? You know, Davion, that's a, a great question. 
but also very difficult to answer. And, and I'll tell you why. We are currently experiencing so much uncertainty. We're understaffed and we're dealing with major budget cuts. And I truly understand that it's because of the global pandemic, right? I understand that. So to answer this question to the best of my ability, knowing that we have very limited resources, it makes it difficult for me to answer. So I would like to instead focus on what we have accomplished and what we foresee taking place, uh, keeping, keeping in mind of the very limited resources we have available. With an immense success initiative uh, earlier this fall, we launched the MSI, Men's Success Initiative Mentorship Program, where we recruited 17 freshmen who identify as men of color and or men. These students were partnered with a mentor who also identify as a Fresno State faculty, staff, and or graduate student. In addition to the mentorship, uh, every the first Friday of each month for two hours, we meet with the, with the mentees and we have conversations around men and masculinity. During those cohort meetings, we also uh, invite a campus representative to inform our students about their programs and service. For example, the first cohort meeting, we invited Dr. Stewart, and he talked about the importance of, of getting involved, right? He talked about how, for example, more women are more involved with uh, clubs and orgs compared to men. The second uh, cohort meeting, which was the following month, we invited a representative from Fresno KISS to talk about safe sex and consent. And one of our colleagues uh, from the Student Health and Counseling Center, uh, he talked about healthy relationships. And this Friday, we're looking forward to, again, meet with our mentees and talk about imposter syndrome. So again, keeping, keeping the limited resources in mind, we're planning for next year and collaborating with Student Involvement, Student Health and Counseling Center, Office of Black Student Success and Career Development to target different areas where men can benefit from these services and programs. Within the Men's Success Initiative, we will continue to plan strategically to serve all students, but in particularly students who identify as men of color and or men. And just a quick side note, right? As a two-time alumni of Fresno State, I truly understand that representation from our leadership, faculty and staff matters. Thank you, Davion. Thank you, brother, for that. Uh, like you said, is we always continue to find ways to impact our man of color, but it's great to have a program and something that we have at Fresno State to support our man of color. And it's going to be a continued work in progress, right? Um, this next question is for my brother, man, TJ Taylor. Uh, for you, what does it mean to be a man? Yeah, that's a very uh, heavy question. Um, what does it mean to be a man? Uh, naturally, like when I think of like my first thoughts, I think of like what my family has taught me to be able, well, not necessarily my family, but my father taught me to make sure I'm able to provide and protect. And like uh, that, that looks different for everybody, you know, um, to be a man, like, like even me for like protection is like, um, I don't possess like a gun or anything, but my dad like taught me like a little karate. So I know a little defense mechanisms here and there here and there. Um, and to provide, like, that's why I'm here getting this degree. So I could, you know, uh, allow myself to uh, receive more sources of income so I could provide for my family um, and help those around me, put other people's around me in positions to succeed as well. Uh, and just to be a person of good character, someone to uh, look up to, uh, leave actions that um, other people go like follow in a positive manner. Uh, just, um, it's a lot, it's a lot that comes with being a man, but ultimately it's all about how you define yourself and how you ask yourself, am I everything I want to be is, that's um, ultimately uh, uh, my take on what it means to be a man, ultimately. Thank you, brother, for that. Um, I love how you talked about how you define yourself, because being a man means different 
than for everybody. Everybody has their own representation and their own meaning. Um, this next question is for Fong in regards to stereotypes. When you hear things like boys don't cry or the stigma uh, about men seeking mental health support, how can these stereotypes of masculinity harm boys and men? And what advice do you have for the men of color slash men who are here today as attendees? Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a really important question, uh, especially coming from, from the community that I'm in, which is the Hmong community. Uh, that has always been a topic of discussion, you know, especially for younger men. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the real question here in, in my community is that, you know, when you show those type of uh, emotions or even affection, I, you know, uh, do people look at you differently? And, and my, in my community has, you know, it, uh, culturally, it has been the case that, you know, a man leads their family, they're strong, they provide, there are the, the, uh, the strength behind the family and they don't show emotion. You know, they don't, they don't have emotion. That's, there's no place for emotion in the life of a, of a Hmong man. And uh, so that's something that, you know, I had to really battle with and even as, as I grew up and I, uh, I, you know, became a young adult and an adult is in my community, we keep everything private from a community where, you know, even less than 50, 50 years ago, before we came to the United States, we lived in a society where mental health support was unheard of, you know, uh, and, and also uh, you have this hierarchy of, of speaking to your parents, then you have to go through your elders and then things got resolved within your circle. So as, as a man, you know, emotions and uh, those things were not really, uh, you know, brought to to the uh, your attention. And then as Mong saying is, is you know, when people see you show emotion or or uh, do you, do they start reflecting or they start saying that are are, are you being a, a a real man? So the way that I've always lived my life and something that I try to teach my two boys is to understand their place as a man in their family and in the community. Uh, in my community as a man, I'm, I, I feel that I, I have responsibility uh, for my family, which is my wife, my three kids, uh, but also to my mother, my, my father and mother-in-law and, and their side of the family. Because in the Hmong community, when you marry one, one person, you marry the whole family. So you are responsible for them too. And I'm the oldest son-in-law. Uh, so in order for me to take on those responsibilities, it's important for me to be responsible for myself. Uh, meaning making good choices as well as seeking help when needed. Uh, in, in my community, especially seeking professional help is seen as a sign of weakness. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, confining to anyone about your emotion status has never been seen as, uh, has not, never been something that, that has been taught by, you know, or by my father or my grandfather. You know, this is something that we didn't speak about. They spoke about all responsibilities towards uh, to you know, responsibilities towards others, but very little about self care about yourself. And I don't believe this is something that Hmong men are not willing to do, but but I think it's instead it's something that they have not learned to do yet. And it can be done, but it, you know it has to be something that are, are is being taught. And and so I'm sh I'm sharing those things to my 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 sons, for example. So so that they can, you know, have a different experience from mine. Thank you Fong, for that. I, I love how you talked about uh, how we learn this. Sometimes we learn this through our family and sometimes we just don't know. And sometimes you have to be exposed to those opportunities to be vulnerable, right? Um, and it's, it's a work in progress. So thank you for that, brother. As we get closer to the end of our Discussion, we got a couple of more questions. Be sure to make sure you answer in those questions and be sure to get ready for our assessment uh, so we can know how we did and how we can improve. But this next question is for Estevan, okay? What has been the most challenging moment you have faced as a leader? You know, Davion, speaking of being vulnerable, right? That, to me, it's an ongoing challenge. You know, the challenge of being vulnerable you know, when you're bullied for years and years, uh, your, your K to 12 years, school years, when you're bullied within your high school, within society, within your household, the only, really, the only last option or resource that I had was to build a, 
a wall of protection to build a shield. So in addition to that, right, I, I felt like I had to prove myself and others that, you know, I am a man and, you know, and, and I'm strong and I will fight you, right? Just to show, our, to show others that I was in fact not weak. Um, so again, coming to Fresno State and having my very own director telling me, Esteban, your tears are welcome here, right? It was so hard for me at first. It was so hard for me at first. And, and now <laughs> I'm proud to say that at least once every three weeks, I, I cried, y'all. I cried with my team at the Cross Culture and Gender Center because the work that we do is really heavy, right? And because we're passionate about the work that we do and we care about it. But it's also important for me to share that I have to also decide when to be vulnerable and when not to be vulnerable. Today, you know, we have over 90 attendees. Today, I told myself that I was okay, that it was okay to be vulnerable. You know, coming out to me as an example of being vulnerable. And I just today, I came out to many folks who don't know me, right? Prior to this event. And I had many options to talk about different other, other hitting identities, but I wanted to focus on my LGBTQ identity. Why? Because I know there is that one student. <clears throat> sorry, that one faculty and staff who needs to be rem reminded that we're here for you. And sometimes that's all you need to hear, someone to listen to you and hear you out. When not to be vulnerable, and again, this is my very own um, personal experience, ongoing experiences. When I go to get my car service, for example, whether Toyota, uh, sorry, Clovis or Fresno, you know, every time I drive up the driveway and I have, for example, last week I had a gentleman who came up to me, an older gentleman, and I, I was pulling up in the driveway to get my car service. I always, always have to remove a photo that's on my dashboard of me and my partner. Why? Because I don't know what this mechanic or technician might intentionally mess up my vehicle. So that's when I choose not to be vulnerable. That's when I choose to hide that identity of being LGBTQ. So the last thing I want to share with you all, this is my last couple of seconds with you all, is that research indicates that one in 10 people identify as LGBTQ+. We currently have 25,000 students on this campus, which means that about 2,500 of our current students identify as LGBTQ. And I want to kindly ask all of you, if you do not feel comfortable supporting one of our students, which you shouldn't, the least you could do is send them to the right programs and services. Please send them to the Cross Culture and Gender Center we welcome everyone with open arms. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you, brother, for uh, being comfortable to express that to people you never met before, or probably you haven't talked to about this before. And and for those shit and like hearing this, I hope that y'all understand that this is powerful stuff that these people are talking about today. This is these are some personal stories, stories that you probably didn't know. So we would love for you to keep it in-house and don't be sharing people's personal information out to everybody, but they blessed you with these, with this stuff today. So definitely give these uh, brothers a, a, a round of applause for being bold, right? Like President Castro always say, being bold today, because they took that chance to be bold with people that they probably never met, never seen, or only seen by one time. So I, I definitely want to say thank you. Thank you, Estevan, um, and Fong, TJ. President Castro for, for being bold today and sharing those amazing stories to us. But we do got one more question, okay? We got one more questions and I hope you guys are writing your questions down as we get close to the end of this panel discussion, which has been powerful. And this last question is to President Castro. Um, there are moments in your leadership we have observed where you were not afraid to be vulnerable. How would you encourage men to be vulnerable? It's a great question. Uh, I just, again, want to say what a privilege it is to be part of this uh, panel today and to listen to Estevan and TJ and, and Fong. Um, you guys are great men. I, 
I see Fong's uh, postings on Facebook and I see what a great father and son and uh, husband he is and and what a great colleague as well. Just a, an honor to be with you today. I, I guess the best way I can answer this is, um, you know, in my own personal situation, um, you know, my family, uh, as I was growing up, didn't show a lot of emotions. My, uh, I didn't realize this until I met my wife, Mary, whose family is completely different than mine. And she said, why, why is everybody holding everything back so much in your family? And, you know, my interpretation of her family is they're, they're always fighting and yelling at each other. So, you know, it's uh, different cultures. But, but I grew up in a situation where, you know, my grandfather uh, never lost his temper, not one time. And I know he was angry at times, but he never showed it to me. So that was a gift on the one hand. And I think I do get my patience uh, from him. But on the other hand, um, you know, a lot went unsaid. And, um, and so I guess as I think about uh, being vulnerable, you know, at times I've shown that as president and certainly that's been a risk. And I've done that at different points in my life. Um, I would just encourage these men and all the other men out there to be yourself. Um, don't, don't try to be somebody else. Be yourself and find the organization like Estevan found Fresno State. This is a place where, as far as I can tell, he's thriving. He, he knows he's got challenges that um, I still you know, need to understand better, but, but I also think this is a great place for him and he's helping to make it a better place. So finding a place where your own values align with those of the organization so that you can be yourself and um, you know as a man of color here <laughs> there have been times where I've been uh, people didn't know I was president of this university and times when I've been completely disrespected on this campus um, so I understand <laughs> what what it can feel like to be a man of color and for stereotypes to be used against you but, but I also, at the same time, I, I just urge you to be yourselves. And, and that enables our young men of color to be themselves as well, to show them what it, what it means to be a loving person, uh, a loving husband, uh, partner, uh, father, uh, brother, uh, son, grandson, to show, show them how that can be. And for guys like me who did not have that in my home every day, you know, I had to kind of learn that from my grandfather and from other men in my life. And I'd like to think I'm a good father now, but I, I, want, I want that for everybody, the ability to be vulnerable as needed and uh, as comfortable. And I know as there are times when folks are not comfortable, but what, whatever situation it is, professionally or personally, uh, to to be yourself and and to let uh, let let you live your life in a way that enables you to thrive. And I guess I'll just end there. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Castro. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, couldn't have said it better. Be yourself, uh, and that looks different for everybody. Uh, and always continue to try to thrive and be the best version of you each and every day you get. Uh, first and foremost, can we give a round of applause for these amazing panelists that took the time out of their busy schedule to come and bless us with these amazing stories uh, today? Can we definitely give a round of applause for those people, these people today? And while we do that, I think we got some questions from uh, the uh, from the viewers today. Let's start with. Uh, and anybody can answer the question. We've got about seven minutes or so. Dr. Francine Naputa asks, what would you say to a 16-year-old about leadership? Anybody can take it. It don't have to be a specific person. Anybody.
happy to jump in. So my own view is that um, talent exists in every single household um, and everybody has the potential to be a leader and um, you know leadership can be presented in lots of different ways and it doesn't have to look a certain way it can look uh, differently and I, and I guess what I would say especially for someone that age is again to look for that alignment between the gifts that they have and and a career that's going to be meaningful and fulfilling and um, and that leads to leadership and and I also believe that um, and I learned this you know I wasn't like this earlier in my career I was so focused on trying to be successful individually but once I let go of that and focused on the greater good and my career became even more successful so there's a paradox there I think so it's that ability also to think about others first and and to be servant uh, focused and and I think good things can happen when when that occurs so I, I could I could jump in also well said dr. Castro I so I have two two uh, kids who are now in college but I I still talk to them about leadership and we have we have deep conversations because they, they both have different point of view about <laughs> leadership styles and I always tell them, you know, leadership starts with you as an individual first. And you have to be able to think for yourself, you know, as, as an individual, everybody's unique, but leadership starts with you and you have to be able to think for yourself. And once you think for yourself, you have to, you have to be willing to do the things that you think about. Uh, that's how people will see you as a leader. And, and uh, I, I'm fortunate to have two kids who are <laughs> who are willing to do what they what they believe in. So I'm I'm pretty blessed in that areas. But that's how what I would say to to any 16 year old who started to discover leadership is you don't have to do what other people are, are asking you to. You need to think on you know for yourself. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else would like to uh, address that question? Oh yeah. Um, I think. Uh, this um, what would we tell our sixteen-year-old self? I would just tell myself to just uh, stay positive, keep moving forward. You're gonna be fine in the end. Awesome. And then we got uh, Esteban. Would you like to address this, or you want me to uh, ask this last question? Because I know we're short on time. Uh, what's the next question, Davion? Uh, the next question is from Robert Ortega. He said, how can you raise the level of expectation for the people you are leading and what are effective ways to get them to see your vision? Can we go back to the other question? I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, a, a commitment. We actually had a conversation with the Men's Success Initiative Committee. And, you know, it's about being transparent, right? And I share with them what I, what I, what I would like to see is commitment from everyone, you know, so how can people, you know, how can they see my vision or our vision as a team? Communication is key, right? And again, we have many challenges coming our way, budget cuts, et cetera, because of the coronavirus. But we're being strategic in the sense that we're partnering with the Office of Black Student Success, Student Health and Counseling Center, and so on to create programming um, to, to, again, target different, uh, concerns that men will benefit from our programs and services. All right, anybody else want to address that? I know we got a couple of uh, minutes or so. I'll, I'll add something to that. I know that this is, this is uh, particularly um, referring back to Dr. Castro. I think that if you want people to follow your vision, you have to start and meet them where they're at. And that's something that I will, you know, miss tremendously about Dr. Castro is that he met us where we were and that's why his people followed him. So that will be my suggestion to, to whoever asked the questions about staff, you know, seeing your vision and following your vision. You have to meet them first where they're at. 
Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I know you guys uh, have some amazing questions, but due to the sake of time, we're not able to answer all of those. But for the questions that we didn't get the answer, we will be sending them out to our panelists to be answered at a later date because uh, we definitely don't want a question get unanswered. But we want to thank you all for your time and coming to support us today. Be on the lookout for more amazing things in the future. Uh, anything uh Am I missing Esteban? If, I, if I'm not missing nothing, you guys are free to go. Enjoy your Monday. Eat some more turkey, macaroni and cheese, some candy yams, all that Thanksgiving leftovers, and, and be safe and take care of yourself, all right? Just real quick, uh, Dr. Castro, any last closing thoughts? Uh, just thank you so much for inviting me, and I, I love that you're having these kinds of conversations, and I hope that you'll continue them. I think... This was a very important and productive discussion, and you have my full support from uh, from Long Beach in any way that I can be of assistance. Okay, love you guys, and we love you too, brother. We love you too. Um, but you guys have an amazing day. Take care, and that's gonna do it for us here. Thank you. <laughs>